This podcast contains factual information only. It is intended for professional financial advisors and does not contain any personal financial advice. You should not make any investment, insurance or financial decisions based on the content of this podcast. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives. And we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Futurity Investment Group is Australia's leading provider of education bonds and has over 45 years of expertise in tax and investments. The tax-effective trust-like structure of an education bond is a solution for all generations and provides unparalleled flexibility and access to deliver on-client goals, ranging from paying for education costs to family wealth transfers. Today's chat is with Jenny Rolf-Wallace. Jenny has a really interesting background and we talk about how do we actually practically improve financial literacy in the next generation, which is different to what I thought it was going to be. We talk about financial advisors and how we need to improve the level of diversity that exists and we call out the structural inequality and changes that need to take place to do that. It was a really interesting chat and I hope you agree. Hello, Jenny, and thank you so much for being here today. Hey, Jess. It's great to be here chatting. So I've got a lot of questions for you, as you can possibly already imagine, but I think the most logical place to start is you've got a very diverse and unique, I would say, background, having stalked you on LinkedIn, (laughs) um, which is so interesting and fascinating, and I have no doubt that that's going to Um, really help pepper today's conversation with interesting and colourful things. Could you perhaps help everyone who is listening learn a little bit about you? Sure thing. I have actually had a really interesting journey personally and in my career as well. So I started my career studying accounting and economics Mm -hmm. and the only reason I did that was because I loved economics. I had the most fabulous teacher in high school who just engendered an absolute love of the subject and I wanted to be an economist and the only way that I could do that was to study accounting as well. Um, But going through that course, I really just developed such a love for finance but also a love of I suppose, teaching and talking to others about the topic. And so instead of going out into accounting initially or into the economic world, I was a teacher. Um, I worked at the university and then in a high school for a while. Mm. Um, And I was teaching personal finance uh, and commerce and all sorts of fun things to the kids and I absolutely loved that. But after a few years, I thought, right, I really need to get out into industry and get some experience. So I ended up while I was teaching, studying uh, both financial planning and law, mm-hmm. and I had an opportunity to enter the financial planning industry. So I worked as an advisor for a number of years, and that was during the 1990s. And so I saw the introduction of FSRA, mm-hmm. and because of my education background, I had a chance to um, then actually teach what was the PS146, now Mm -hmm. RT146, and, of course, now totally superseded courses. And so for the last 20-odd years, um, I've actually been focusing in the financial education space. Mm -hmm. Um, I've worked at a couple of unis and I moved out of advice because I just I loved being able to work with advisors but then also working in consumer education. So I'd actually describe myself as... um, a financial education specialist, Mm -hmm. but with a real passion for helping people to understand the complexities and really taking those difficult concepts and putting them into everyday language um, so that people can feel confident in their decision making, whether that's as an advisor or um, as a consumer. And I particularly love working with women and I always have 
um, from my advice days right through to my consumer education days now. We're both smiling yeah. on that front. You can't see it, but we are. It's such a great, interesting background. I was like, oh, my gosh, look at this. She's been a teacher. She's taught at universities around financial advice. She's been a financial advisor. She's now doing, yeah. you know, consulting and education stuff, which we're going to get into in a minute. But, um, yeah, I was so excited to have you as today's guest uh, because I think that this is just such a space that, you know, it's just, Jenny, why don't we teach all of this stuff at school. It still blows my mind that it's 2022 and this is still something that we don't really get very, you know, much education on or taught about unless our parents do it. Why do you think that is still? Well, that is a great question. And the answer to that is financial literacy is actually embedded in the Australian curriculum. Uh, But there's a few problems about the way that it rolls out in schools Mm. and part of it is actually the way that it's designed. So a little disclaimer here, I've been working towards a PhD for a little while and my topic is actually on the financial socialisation of children and primarily looking at uh, the role of parents. And the reason I did that was because years and years ago I came across some research that shows, do you know what, if we teach kids financial literacy, and I'm using that term very specifically, in school or even at a tertiary level, it doesn't result in long-term changes in behaviour. And part of the reason is because we might know this stuff, like we know we should eat well and we should exercise and all of the things, but we don't necessarily do it. And that really highlights how important understanding our values and our attitudes and our behaviour is to our financial decision making. So if we want to be make good decisions with money, we have to understand what motivates us. And in schools, the focus is on can you calculate a percentage? Do you understand the different interest rate structures? And it's really dry and it's often taught from a maths perspective and there's a lot of great research and Australian-based research as well um, coming out of a number of universities that show actually teachers aren't really prepared, equipped and resourced to teach these topics. Now, we know there's a lot of great stuff that ASIC Money Smart has done, Mm. but the research says about 80% of teachers don't feel confident teaching financial literacy, let alone financial capability or financial well-being. And so we often, when we're teachers, we default to what we know and our own lived experience and many teachers are no different to anybody else. Some are great with money and some aren't. So Mm -hmm. there are all of these layers that mean that if we try to embed financial literacy, knowledge in schools, uh, we need to make sure that it's looking at behaviours and values and attitudes as much as the numbers. And, you know, a lot of the measures like the PISA test that shows Australian 15-year-olds have declining levels of financial literacy are really focused focused on those mathematical concepts and we need to actually revamp financial education in school. The other missing piece, which is what my research is looking at, is uh, what role do, do families play? Because what you learn in the home is so influential on the behaviors that you that you demonstrate when you are older mm. um, and we do what we learn. We follow often the role models we've been given, whether that's to do what they did or do the opposite of what they did. Mm. And when I first started doing my research, I discovered that um, the parents that I interviewed were really keen to teach their kids about money. They wanted to be involved. Um, very few of them said that they felt their parents had prepared them for the financial world. And yet what was really interesting, that default parenting, what they were doing with their kids was what their parents had done with them. But they'd already kind of acknowledged that what their parents did didn't work. And what I realised was we actually have such a gap in supporting parents to consciously teach their kids about money, to unpack our own financial values and attitudes and behaviours and then look at how do we actually um, teach our kids. And it's really exciting because there's 
so many people that are doing great great work in this space mm. um like Lacey Philippich of the money school she does some great stuff grounded in entrepreneurship for kids mm. and they show that it's more than just the knowledge it's about the behaviors it's about capability it's about applying skills and that's what we really need to be focusing on in education so yep we need to do financial education in early years but we need to do it far better and we need to acknowledge that there's a partnership between homes parents and carers and schools as well and we shouldn't just be putting the burden on schools because schools will teach one thing but if kids are seeing a different thing in the home uh, you're not necessarily going to get that integrated change and that's what the research tells us this is so interesting, my brain. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You kind of you've hit one of my favourite topics, Jess. I, I love this because so, everyone has opinions and yet actually when you look at the research, you know, it's so multi-layered, it's so multifaceted. The other thing is that a lot of the financial literacy programs and particularly those that are targeted low-income earners mm. kind of teach this idea, oh, you can budget your way out of poverty. And that is just so far from the truth. Mm. And part of the problem with these uh, programs is often they are developed by people with a particular lived experience. And if I'm going to really stereotype the people that are often involved in creating these programs, you know, if you name the, the people who have been really influential in the Australian financial education landscape of recent years, they are all largely white affluent men and when they're coming from a particular lived experience it often means they're bringing their unconscious biases and I've seen that in a lot of um, financial literacy programs where the assumption is that um, well you're you're in poverty or you're struggling financially because you don't know how to manage your money I tell you what if you want to find someone who is a brilliant budgeter you find a single mum mm. who is living on a, a limited income, mm -hmm. they know how to make the most of it. Mm -hmm. They know how to squeeze the last dollar. The issue is not budgeting. Yeah. <laughs> the issue is far broader and it's systemic and it, and it ties into why so many women experience financial insecurity throughout their life. Absolutely. And, you know, I read this research. Uh, I don't think it's Australian research. I think it's European research, which frightened me. Uh, and it talked about, obviously, the – existence of a wage gap which we know is real it's real yes, uh, very real very big and we know from that research that it actually starts at home coming to that piece around that behavioral um, family component to teaching your kids about money I was mortified to learn that I think from like age 10 there is already a gendered wage gap for pocket money and roles inside a home yes yes and again, it's unconscious. No one does that intentionally, right? Well, I'd, I'd like to think people don't do that intentionally. But yes, you're absolutely right. It actually starts from very early years and it's uh, it has long-term impacts. Yeah, yeah, totally does. Yep. And then it perpetuates that cycle that you're talking about, which is that unconscious bias and belief around how uh, duties are divided in a home and how income is produced and that has lifelong impacts and we're seeing that right now. And so if we're thinking about how mm. do we help the next generation and the generation after, then I think we all need to take a look at not only for our clients but actually ourselves what's going on in our family. In fact, I um, yeah. I have a small terrific niece and she is um wild so she clearly does not take after me at all <laughs> and i bought her um these series of books around money and teaching them about money and so one is around saving and what does saving actually mean and investing and i said to my sister-in-law please read her these and please make sure that she you know gets them over and over and over again and she said to me jess where did you get these from because i've been to so many kids bookstores and i've not seen anything fun and interesting about kids and money. And when I, I actually thought about it and I looked it up and I thought, to your point, all of the kids' books around money are written by like guys in 90s suits. And I was like, oh my gosh, could we do anything worse to engage the next generation about money? I yeah. Mean, it's, it's frightening. It's frightening. Yes. Yes. But you know what? There are some great things out there. You do just need to go. Um, and look for them. Have you ever uh, come across the Luna Jeff, Jeffy books? No. Wild Money and the journals. So she is US-based and she's a, a 
an, a financial advisor, but she's also an artist, and she has written these most beautiful um, books and journals around money, and they are aesthetically stunning, but also the way they interact um, and encourage the person reading and um, to write and to reflect. And it's a completely different approach to often the recipe book approach to to financial security where you have to have buckets or you have to save a certain perspective or you have to, you know, you must do it this way. It actually is just beautiful and I often uh, will recommend that to my creative friends who say that they're no good with money but actually just have never found a way to relate to it um, in a way that's fun and interesting. Isn't that a shame? We make it so boring. Finance is awesome. Money stuff is fun. Yeah. And how beautiful that your niece has you to talk to because I think having those conversations with the with the little people in our lives are so important and especially as an auntie because you can have conversations and send messages that they will ignore their parents or their primary caregivers mm. but they'll listen to the extended family in their life and I think that's a really really important thing to do I just asked my nieces and nephews they'll tell you how annoying I was I used to give them cards on their 18th and 21st birthdays with an amount of money in and say now if you save this amount every week instead of buying pizza and going out this is how much you'll have when you're 30 and 40 and 50 I'm sure they did not pay attention to me at all but um it, it was just that opportunity to have have those conversations. If this isn't just twenty dollars or fifty dollars, this is thousands over your lifetime. Do you know what I did? So I only have one niece, and I'm very hopeful that I don't end up with scores of them because I don't think I'll be able to do this for all of them. But at this point, it's okay. Um, so when my niece was born, I got this um, uh, box embossed for her with her name and her birthday, and. Every birthday, every Christmas, I write her a letter, random musings that she'll probably burn in a rage of, you know, um, teenage angst at 16 or whatever. Um, but, you know, I talk about what's going on in the world and some of the political issues and, like, how much does coffee cost because I think inflation will be interesting by the time she reads it. Yeah. But I started an investment um, bond for her with a vesting age of 25 so that she's not 18 and wild um, yes. and she doesn't get gifts from me. So she gets money put into her investment um, portfolio and, you know, she would have no idea that she's missing a few toys along the way. But, you know, I try to explain to her throughout the letters, you know, what does it mean and why are we doing this and what is this going to offer her the opportunity to do? Now she's too little to actually take it all in. Um, but even something like that, I tell people that I did it and people think it's like mind blowing. And I'm like, we need to normalize awesome. this yes. stuff. Yes, absolutely. That's great. Thank you. And I'm sure she won't book Ben and I'm sure she'll... <laughs> If it maybe it was from a parent, maybe, but, you know, cool Annie chairs, she'll be like, these are awesome. I hope so. Yes. So what advice, okay, let's say a parent is listening who is feeling mm -hmm. slightly guilty about the fact that they too have said, and maybe they are an advisor who said, oh, it's a sh shame that we don't teach financial education, but hasn't actually started to embody that in their own home or start to notice some of those unconscious biases that live and exist in most people's yeah. um, houses. What do you think they should do? How do they start? Well, I think the first thing is to realise you're actually already doing it. You're just not doing it consciously. Mm. Um, we are all modelling to our kids attitudes and behaviours around everything um, because kids are like sponges mm. and they watch us and they take it in. So firstly, just make it a conscious thing. So say, right, they're getting messages from me. What messages do I want to get? Look for the teachable moments, I think, is a great thing. So um, if you ever ask my kids, they will roll their eyes and tell you all the times we've been shopping or and, and from when they were little, I'm, I'm talking when they wouldn't even be able to verbalise, having conversations with them about making choices and comparing is this a better buy or is that a better buy and 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 role modeling that budgeting even through little things like shopping mm. um talking about uh opportunity costs so if we go to a fate for example or um you know kids always want things right because yes. that's how we're wired yes. often and so they might be given five dollars um for a school fate and it's like right 
There's your five dollars. There's your ten dollars. You can spend it on whatever you want, but there is no money when this is finished. Mm. And it's really interesting watching them as they grow. That well, is that one dollar toffee apple, five dollar ride? Oh, I don't want to pay ten dollars for that because that's my money all gone. And understanding, well, you can have that, but if you have that, you might have to give up something else. And and do you know what? I love kids handling cash because we know from a psychology perspective. When we hand over cash, we actually trigger the pain points in our brain and there's that sense of loss, mm. which we don't get when we're spending cards or online. Mm. That actually triggers our pleasure points, yeah. so we love it. Yeah. But when there is that sense of loss of handing over, and I think it's really great for kids to learn those skills of counting out money, getting change, handling that, and I know we're moving towards a cashless society. But kids learn initially through concrete experiences and I think if you can give them that, those opportunities to handle cash, to pay over, to get the change, is that right? It's a way of just embedding those things very naturally. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing that we've done in our family um, from a very young age, if they have saving goals, we will do research. They want to buy a thing, let's say it's an iPad, saying that because there's one in front of me. Uh, we'll work out how much that is um, and, okay, how much will you need to save, how much does that work out per job and know your time is not worth $50 an hour, how much are you really worth as an unskilled labour? <laughs> um, and then like with my daughter when she, she's now 14 but when she was four she was saving for something. We had a jar, we had a picture on the front of the jar with the item, the amount she needed to save, she had her jobs and we would – we would put the money in when she earned when she earned it. Grandma would pay far better than me, mm. so she saved quite quickly, but we would count the money and it was just those skills so that now that she's older, she's a teenager, she has her own job earning her own money and we're still having those conversations. It's just in a different context and their conversations that started when she was little, little and have just been built on over time. So I think it's about looking for the opportunities in the moment, uh, using the teachable moments, making it as concrete as you possibly can when they're younger and just having those very open conversations with them um, and just make it explicit. So I, I will talk to them explicitly about um, the money stuff as I do about anything in their life. And having said that, I'm sure they will make mistakes and make different choices to me and that's okay because we learn mm. through those experiences. But I think that's something my parents did really well even though we, I grew up in a really, really low-income home. We, we talked about money stuff, often the lack of it and how you made it stretch. Mm -hmm. But those conversations I think really gave me a great base for what I – I then had a conscious approach as an adult and that's what I'm trying to replicate with my kids because that, that um, is what the research says, you know, if we can make it explicit and give them skills and just start with the little things. Mm. I got no financial literacy from my parents. Um, it was actually quite a good learning of how not to behave with money, I think is probably what I saw. And that made me um, very conservative, too conservative with money, actually, because I watched my parents make some interesting financial choices. And actually one of them, Jenny, <laughs> I think about this and I hope my mother never listens to these podcasts. Um my mum used to make us hide her credit card statements in her sock drawer. And so it was a thing about when we got the mail, we would have to go through it and look for who the logo <laughs> on the front. And if it was X, Y, or Z logo, we'd have to hide the the mail in the in the sock drawer. And I think about this now trying to teach people about, you know, um, communication around money and, you know, no secrets and all of those things. And I think, oh, my goodness, interesting, interesting. So it's – But isn't mm -hmm. isn't that interesting, the fear and the emo – like everybody, every single person has an emotional response to money. You mentioned money and whether it's empowerment or fear, we all have an emotional response and it's about recognising that. And, you know, how – what a different point if you can feel empowered. This is what I love about working um, – in the consumer education space, when people feel empowered and in control and they're not driven by fear, mm. it, 
it lets them make different choices rather than feeling like money controls them. And money at the end of the day is just a tool. It's not a measuring stick. It's just something that we use in our society. And that feeling around empowerment is so, so important. And it's it's not a uh, – I think it's really interesting that the choices we make are our choices based on our values, but it's if we feel in control of our money, not that money's controlling us, if we are living our preferred lifestyle, whatever that looks like, not feeling pressured from external forces, I think that's a beautiful feeling if you can reach that point um, and where you see money as a tool to achieve the life we want to live. I'd rather be happy and feel empowered than live in fear Mm. or, or stress and worry, which is I think one of my overriding memories as a kid was would there ever be quite enough money Mm. to do what was needed Mm. but isn't that interesting how our our childhood experiences does influence how we respond as as adults totally and even as someone who works in this sector and who understands all the you know my money story is still showing up a lot and so I've done a lot of work on it and I actually know that many financial advisors don't talk about this this isn't part of their remit this is superfluous fluffy not necessary because we give great portfolio investment advice i mean what would you say to someone who thinks that jenny ah well i think that well let's look at the most common reasons for complaints client complaints Mm -hmm. is that They'll complain about fees and not understanding fees and charges. They'll complain about market volatility and risk, mm-hmm. and they'll complain that they didn't understand the advice. That that wasn't what I was told. Um, so we do have a job, financial advisors. I mean, you look at the code of ethics. We have a responsibility. There's a, a legal duty of care to clients, and a large part of that is understanding where your clients are at. And I think their money story is a really essential part of it because you can come up with the best strategy, using the best products and clients will still have a sense of inertia if you haven't overcome mm. though or addressed those emotional responses that they're having to it or as soon as the market dips. And I was an advisor during 2000 and um, during the 9-11 attacks. Wasn't that a fun couple of weeks, mm. right, when the market absolutely went haywire? That time showed, I think, the importance of those client relationships and understanding your clients and, in my case, having spent a lot of time getting to know them and educating them around investment and volatility and markets. And, you know, we if we want to act in the best interest of or financial advice, because I'm not an advisor anymore, but if we want to act in the best interest of our clients or the people that we're working with, we need to understand what motivates them and we need to make sure that we're genuinely addressing their concerns because the best strategy will mean nothing if someone isn't committed and motivated to achieve it. And understanding the why I think is really important as well. Mm. Why this strategy? Um, People engage with advisors because of the knowledge and the skills and the ability to wade through all the complexity and come up with a great strategy and appropriate products. But take them on that journey. I think it's really, really important. I left advice because I wanted to spend more time on that. I wanted to spend less time choosing products and more time help like taking people on that journey. Mm. But you can absolutely do it, I think, together. I think the best advisors naturally do. And what would you say for someone who's like, oh, my goodness, this is a light bulb moment. You're right. I must do that. Do you have ideas? Do you have resources that you would put them, you know, to go and check out? Do you have great questions that you would suggest that they start asking their clients? Where do they start if they're feeling a little bit overwhelmed by it? Do you think? That's a great question. (laughs) I think, uh, you know, given that everybody needs to do CPD and keep those uh, points up, I think doing some investigation into some of the financial psychology, behavioural finance stuff Mm. is a really great point, great way to start Um, and that can kind of tick off that CPD or professional development um, or education side of things as well. Um, But there's 
some really interesting emerging um, stuff in the behavioural finance space, behavioural economic space, and plus some older books too. Like I've got one that is ancient. I'm sure it's called The Psychology of Saving. And it, I know I spend some time trying to understand human nature because I think actually a lot of financial advisors do this intuitively. Like it's a financial advice is a people industry. It's about understanding people. It's about connecting to people. And so the basis would be there, I'd imagine, but it's just finding some resources and tools to support probably what many people already have a basis for. So uh, I cannot on this on the on the spot think of any resources, mm-hmm. but perhaps that's something that I can provide. No, that's okay. I, I, Sorry, Jess, that was um, no. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I read Money a lot. My mind went blank <laughs> then. <laughs> no, and I'm putting you on the spot, so don't worry at all. Um, I read years ago. I read Money a Love Story. And I found that quite interesting to give, it gave really specific questions that you had to work through as the reader in sort of like a, um, like have a workbook next to you as you're doing it. And I think even just reading books like that as an advisor and starting to incorporate them, we incorporate some of those questions into our uh, onboarding journey and it helps us coach our members as well. So, so many yeah. to, to your point before, like, There is so much emotion wrapped around money and the idea of money and so many, particularly women, come to me with all of this shame and fear and stigma about what they know or don't know or where they're at and helping them learn and watching them change is one of my greatest privileges actually as an advisor. It's really beautiful. And you know what? There are so many amazing books written by Australian women in the finance space now. Mm. I have an entire bookshelf yes. full of, <laughs> or a few shelves full of them, um, and they they are brilliant mm. because they, are, you know, previously a lot of the books, you know, were were again coming from a very narrow lived experience, but whether you're talking about Mel Brown mm. or Lacey or Natasha Jansen's mm. or um, uh, Julie Newbold and Kate McCallum's The Joy mm-hmm. of Money. I love giving that book because it, it is beautiful and it's bite-sized and it's got stories. Yeah. But even giving those types or, or having a list of resources that clients can go and read to help them along the journey because, you know, most people have, have a bit of work to do um, in that space. So having resources that can support them, not necessarily thinking you have to be the one to take them on the journey. So it's mm. how do you, as an advisor, tap into the amazing resources that are out there? You do not have to be all things to all people, mm. but if you know where to send um, clients for specific resources, that can really help. And I think touching on that, one thing that is often not talked about enough is the impact of, of um, economic abuse on women and on women's financial security. And I think particularly with when we're working with clients who may be couples, having an awareness that economic abuse is something, well, you know, family and domestic violence is something that happens across every single socio-demographic group, Mm. um, every single part of our community, regardless of a person's net wealth or where they live. And a large part, estimates are around 40%, goes unreported. And we often think it's related to physical um, abuse or sexual abuse, but in fact, economic abuse occurs in 90% of family and domestic violence situations. And it often falls under that banner of coercive control. So understanding that, you know, when we're working with clients as advisors, that you will have clients who are experiencing an economic abuse situation. And often for women who have left relationships, there will be a large portion again who have experienced economic abuse. And there is a whole raft of trauma and complexity that goes along with that. And you mentioned shame. Mm. And shame is absolutely one of those things because, you know, um, for a lot of women, very even very educated women who had their own careers and had their own money who may have taken time out of the workforce to care for kids and that's often when family and domestic violence ramps up um, and find themselves a year later a bit like a a frog in a pot of cold water Mm. where the heat is gradually turned Mm. up and they leave that relationship 
having experienced gaslighting, having experienced that coercive control, having experienced economic abuse that is not necessarily presented as abusive behaviour. You know, I'll just look after the money. Don't you worry about that. And yet it's so, so common. And I think being aware of that and how do we support clients who are or who have experiencing that and understanding that actually working with those clients presents very different challenges to working with somebody who has not experienced that. Totally. So I um, I am so passionate about talking about financial abuse because as a female, as a young female who works in finance, I haven't heard much about financial abuse before. And so I interviewed uh, Moo Balch uh, for the International yes. Women's Day. Moo's amazing. She's yeah. amazing. And so if this is a, an area that you're grappling with, because, you know, just listening to her, you're right. It's really, really complex and challenging. Um, she actually helped us understand what do you do if you suspect it? What do you do if someone acknowledges that that's happening? And how do you help them getting the resources and the the care and services they need, noting that it can be a really dangerous time in someone's life? So yes, um, absolutely. not to toot my own horn, but go and check out that specific episode on that if that's something that you need to learn more about. But you're absolutely right. And you're right. We need to start normalizing these conversations. This is our world. This is our realm. And this links into what you were saying before about young people. We did some research in um, our local area where we are in Wagga as part of a thing called the DV Project 2650 mm-hmm. because in our region um, our reported rates of domestic violence are 29% higher than the rest of New South Wales. Um, and so we created a, a primary prevention campaign which ran over three years and it was really interesting how and we know this from research that domestic abuse, family domestic abuse, links so strongly to rigid gendered stereotypes. But what was quite concerning was that when we did the pre-project um, research into community attitudes and then we did the post-project community attitudes, the group that had shifted the least in holding these very rigid gender stereotypes were young men. And they did not see, and and young people generally in in our community, and I'm going to guess it's very similar across Australia, they didn't actually see controlling money as a form of abuse. And we need to have those conversations with all of the young people in our lives to actually say, well, it is, and it's not okay. And preventing, Prevention is so much better than um, dealing with situations when they arise. But we also need to be careful that we're not we're not telling women to fix themselves because it's actually a systemic issue, um, and that's the same that ties in with financial insecurity as well. Women are not the problem. Women do not need to fix ourselves. We actually need to fix the systems mm. that give rise to these situations and gendered stereotypes are part of that, which ties back to, you know, kids earning different amounts from when they're very young right through to the pay gap, right to the fact that, you know, less than, you know, less than a quarter of financial advisors are women in Australia and it's just this wickedly integrated issue really. And you know what though? Women are great at money stuff. Women are fantastic, but we are often told that we're not and we're often told that I, I read a brilliant comment on a um, on an article that someone had published about um, trying to get more women into the financial planning industry and the person commenting went, well, maybe it's just time to accept that, that men are more interested in finance than women. It's like, really? No. No. <laughs> No. Women are great investors. Women are actually really great at evaluating risks and really great at making decisions and really good at sticking to strategy. Women are brilliant. Um, we're, we're just often told we're not. Also, we're operating, whether you're an advisor or a client, you're working in a system that is dominated by men. For the record, I do love men, but um, dominated by men, where products are made by men. For men, there's a brilliant book called Invisible Women that looks at the impact of data. Have you you've read that? It's it's, it's on my hit brilliant. list. It's on my hit list. Oh, it's it's fantastic. It is brilliant, and you can see the parallels 
into finan- the financial advice industry as well. You know, the fact that we have superannuation, which I love super, but super is made for somebody that starts work when they finish school and work consistently through their life, never taking time off, hitting their peak earnings in their 40s and 50s, which is your typical man. Wow. And this is why so many women now and into the future will not have sufficient savings in retirement despite the fact we live longer, right? Mm-hmm. So products are, you know, products are problematic. The systems are problematic. The rules, you know, um, paid parental leave, which is based on, you know, a, a woman can't, at the, under current rules, can't access if, if they're earning 150000 or more. Yet their partner could easily be earning more than that and she could access right. it. Yeah, right. Oh, it, the government, the government's announced some changes, but it's still not going to address the fundamental issue around the way we split unpaid caring. But um, mm. paid parental leave is such a flawed system because it assumes so much about work patterns and about earning capacity, and we need to really unpack these systemic issues. And I think as financial advisors, part of the job is not just working with clients, but actually lobbying for change. And the more women you can get in the industry. Yeah then the greater those, and not just women from diverse backgrounds as well, right? Completely increasing the diversity in the industry and you get those different voices and you can lobby for change and you can advocate for a more equitable system because at the moment there is so much inequity that leads to women statistically being more likely to live in poverty and and experience financial insecurity and women are not the problems. We are great with money. We just kind of need a fig. We need a level playing field. Yeah. And I think uh, if you are not a female listening to this, you have to help us. We need your help as well. And so you're right. It is something that we have been so busy. Frankly, I, I know that financial advisors particularly ones that run small businesses, we wear many hats. We totally do. And it's oh, hard. Yes, yes. It's bloody hard work. Yeah. But yes. who cares? We need to do this. Um, I think lobbying is really vital and actually missing. So I'm just going to publicly say, dear super funds, dear investment product providers, dear anyone that works in marketing, come and talk to me. I've got ideas. I've got big ideas on how we can help make it more equitable, but also more inclusive. It really needs to be inclusive. Completely. And you know what? Women in super, there are some great groups out there, Mm. great voices out there. Women in super have been saying for years, you know, the $450 a month threshold excluded disproportionately women. Do you know that parental leave, paid parental leave, is the only paid leave that does not attract superannuation guarantee, regardless of who takes it? And so there are these these little things that uh, that create significant inequities in the long term long run and even the assumption that people are always in coupled relationships or have kids or whatever else. We need to kind of really revamp that. Another thing that ties into it, you know, is the is the issue around underinsurance. Women are by far mm. more more likely to be underinsured than men. Yeah. And there's lots of reasons for that. And I know from my personal experience that is so, so important to have the right personal insurances in place for when the what-ifs happen. Mm. Um, But, again, it leads to um, so much stress Mm. uh, in a household or on an individual if they don't have the right insurance. And income protection is a perfect example. You know, uh, the latest – the the. Statistics that I most recently looked at said that only around 25% of women who are eligible have income protection insurance, which is completely concerning given that for most people the ability to earn an income is your greatest asset. And I will always be thankful for Paul Clitheroe's Making Money book for making me realise that and the next week running out and getting income protection insurance. And for me, I was a uh, assistant to a BDM in an insurance company and she said to me, listen here, if you're going to work here, you got to have it. And I was about to go on a holiday and I was 20 or 21 and I was like, yeah, sure, um, but I just need to go on this holiday and then when I come back from the holiday, I- I'll get it. So she was like, 
no, 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 no. <laughs> you will not go on the holiday without this cover. And I am so grateful because I am now uninsurable. Um, but you just actually sent shivers down my spine. 25% of women who are eligible to take out income protection have it. And that's including those that have it in their super fund. Um, look, and that may be a slightly outdated statistic, but uh, mm. that was that was two years ago. Mm, probably um, not outdated. And that I that I got that stat, and I don't imagine that it's really changed. And we talk about you know under insurance for house and cars and all the rest of it, but uh, ourselves. But it's even you know total and permanent disability cover. It, it is even if you are the primary caregiver. You know, what happens if you can't fulfill that role? You know, mm. who is going to provide that? This is where having trauma cover, total and permanent disability, and, and as much as the home duties definition is so narrow. Um, but, yeah, just having that protection for the what ifs because if we look at, you know, a, a stereotyped couple relationship with kids where, the woman provides a lot of the unpaid care and domestic duties and the other partner is out earning the income, it's still a massive contribution. I think one of the figures put the value of the contribution if you had to outsource the cooking, the cleaning, the the running around, mm. um, it was in excess of $150,000. Where does that money come from to, or, or how do families cope if – the primary or the person in that primary role can't do it and it needs to be addressed as part of advice. It, it absolutely needs to be addressed and if my attitude has always been if a family relies on an income or an unpaid contribution, then you ensure that no matter if you possibly can yeah. um, and find ways to make that work. And I think holding space for challenging conversations where you push back on someone who doesn't believe that that's you know, an important thing to cover, I think is very important as well. Yes. Well, I'll never forget a conversation I had with a client when we were talking about insurance. And I've always been a, a massive, massive fan of insurance because I've seen what happens if people do and don't have it. And, um, you know, the, the partner turned around and said, when I was asking, you know, have you thought about what would happen? You know, the usual kind of conversation. Mm. And he went, oh, she'll be right. She'll just marry somebody else. And I was like, I have no come to that. But really? Really? Oh, God. I don't think that's a great financial plan. Let's talk about some alternative provisions you can put in place. But, um, yeah, and he was dead set serious. Right, he was. She'll be fine. She'll just go and marry some rich guy and it'll all work itself out. <laughs> Newsflash, it did not work itself out. That's not what no. happens. Um, I want to ask you a question because I'm conscious of time and I could I want to talk to you all day long but I know that you have a life and so that's very sad for me um given your work with universities and my real fear that we are not going to have the number of women giving advice grow a lot do you have any thoughts on how we can grow the level of diversity in all its forms in those giving advice yeah look I think this is such a massive challenge and and you know, look, having lived through FASIA and FO, um, sorry, um, FSRA and FOFA and then the FASIA changes and this idea of, of educating up the population, advising population, which is absolutely important. We need professionalism and ethics and competency, absolutely. But I look at, you know, for example, the requirements around the professional year or the requirements around education and, and then the CPD, um, and it's always been difficult for women to not just gain entry to the industry but to continue in the industry. And it's not about interest and it's not about desire but it is about the practicality of how our life balance sometimes goes. Mm. And um, I remember having a conversation with a, a licensee, would have been a good eight, nine years ago, about the difficulty they were having retaining women um, because it's not set up as a part-time career and yet so many other industries have capacity for women to, you know, there might be a reduction in CPD points, for example, mm -hmm. or a reduction in the cost, you know, pro rata membership. 
all of these things. So if you're working a part-time role, and I'm not saying that all women do that, but statistically more likely to, right? So if we want to talk about retaining women in the industry as a starter, we need to look at making it cost-effective and time-effective because if you have a choice between seeing and seeing clients or doing CPD, what are you going to want to do? Mm. I don't know anyone that became a financial advisor to do education and CPD. Mm-hmm. So we have the practicalities and you need to be able to make a living and particularly if you're a small business owner. You know, I you know, remember there was a certain amount that I need to earn before I got out of bed kind of just to make ends meet as a small business advisor back in the day. Mm. So we need to be able to make it cost effective and time effective. We also need to make it relevant. We need we need more high profile women, I suppose, lobbying and advocating for women in the industry as well. But the industry needs to and the regulators need to look at what are the systems and structures that they have in place that are excluding women. And yes, you can have a young person come out of school and study and go and do their PY and that's great. But some of the most amazing advisors are those that came to the industry as a mature age person Mm. with a wealth of lived experience. And if you are a woman who statistically gendered stereotypes, has the primary caregiving, balancing study and work and kids and all of the rest of it, it's an obstacle. How do we get rid of those obstacles to make it more workable without uh, lowering the standard? Mm. And I think we actually really need to, I don't think there's an easy solution to that, but I think it needs to be discussed and I think it needs to be put on the table and it does affect women more than mm. men. It is a gendered issue. Mm. Um, and I think how do, yeah, how do, how do practices build at a practical level, how do you build support I think often advisors have traditionally, we've been, you know, you've been a silo and you've had your client. Maybe it's time to think of, you know, multi-group practices where there is a team of advisors that work with a client Mm. um, and there's that potential for job sharing, Mm. for example. You know, let's really rethink what has been and kind of engineer what could potentially be moving forward. But unfortunately, the regulation the insurance, the cost doesn't facilitate that. And that's a problem. And I think the regulators really need to take some time. We kind of need to hold a mirror back to them and and raise it as an issue with them to say, this is a problem. How do you think it could be solved without compromising standards? Agree. And thank you (laughs) for us even having this conversation. I think it's really important. Uh, your research is fascinating. I am. Uh, please let us know when you've fi- finalised all of the research that you're doing for your PhD. I'd be fascinated to learn more about it. Um, how can people learn more about you and all of the great work that we haven't even really touched on that you do? Do you want to just give everyone a, a really quick overview of all the great things that you do now and how people can find you? So my, my business is the Sprout Education Group. And I'm doing a lot of, I suppose, behind the scenes work around economic abuse and advocating for women um, around financial insecurity and linking into um, my work in in the PhD space as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, And really looking at that lobbying and advocating as well as consumer education. So what I really do is I help people to change how they think and feel about money, but I really want to change the system so that it is far more equitable for people and that there is greater diversity and there is a wide range of voices heard in policy development and in strategy so that, you know, in 10, 20 years' time, we're not having a conversation about why is only a quarter of the workforce of financial advisors women? Why are women overwhelmingly experiencing financial insecurity? Why do so many women don't have superannuation when they retire? I really want to see that change and that's what I'm I'm working behind the scenes to achieve. Well, I just want to say an enormous thank you because it's hard work 
it's no doubt messy, complicated, difficult, frustrating work at times, but goodness me, we need more people like you, Jenny. So thank you on behalf of basically everyone, because there is no one that doesn't win from this, both from a a client and an advisor side. So I want to say a huge thank you. Keep doing the great, amazing work that you're doing. And before you go, can I ask you some rapid fire questions? Sure. <laughs> I do this for everyone and it's um, it's the same questions. So I'm just going to spit them out. Whatever comes to your mind first is correct. Uh, what do you do to look after your mental health? Oh, I landscape. I dig holes in my garden mm-hmm. and I put plants in and I design and get my hands dirty. I love it. Love growing food to eat. Oh, my goodness. I love that. Um, do you have yep. a piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? Do what you're doing. Trust your instinct absolutely and do not listen to the negative voices. You've got this. This is amazing. Uh, What is one big thing that's on your bucket list that you haven't ticked off yet? Oh, great question. Uh, (laughs) Great question. I know it's tricky. Well, it's interesting that you asked me that given that I almost died and kind of totally rejected my bucket list. Mm. Um, Because you had something, you had an event occur which made you quite unwell. So you might have recalibrated what your bucket list list looks like after that. Yes. so, So I think, do you know what? I think the one thing I haven't done that I will do before I die is write We'll get my PhD finished Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and write my book, which is in the financial literacy, well-being kind of space, but very much looking around women's experiences in financial insecurity. So that's my bucket list. I'm very happy that that's on your bucket list because that is a giant segue into my last question. Which is what's a book for me to read as part of my fake book club? I have a fake book club, which is just everyone help me read uh, great books. And so obviously yours will need to be on there once it's published. Please let me know. Absolutely. Once. Yes, definitely. Ah, gosh, so many. You know what? I'm going to say um, Luna Jaffe's books the um around wild money because they are beautiful and they are in the financial space but they are just so different they bring a different lens to the money stuff and i think they are wonderful fascinating adding to the list jenny Great. i have loved chatting with you we have a lot of the same views and you are doing amazing work thank you so much for being part of the podcast today it has been delightful chatting to you thanks jess 